All right, we're joined on the dais here right now by Villanova student athletes, Michael Bridges, Jalen Brunson, and Phil Booth. Just a couple reminders before we get started here with these guys. Uh, any of the uh, sessions that were, went on earlier today, uh, they are available for download via the NCAA Digital Media Hub. If you go to ncaa.com backslash media hub, you can download any of the upcoming press conferences or the ones we've already had. Uh, also, when uh, you ask for a question, please give your name and your affiliation. And also a reminder, these can be audio taped. They cannot be videoed. So with that, uh, we're going to open up the questions to the student athletes. Doug Galassi with the uh, Pittsburgh Tribune Review. Jalen, uh, being named a finalist for the Naismith Award, uh, just what does that mean to you as, as leader of this team? Uh, it definitely means a lot. Um, it means a lot to my family, to this university. And, um, I think it's a credit to my teammates. Uh, they gave me the confidence uh, to be, be the player I am. And so um, I just, I'm really thankful for them just helping me, help me become in this position. Chris Mueller, uh, City of Basketball Love. As you prepare for you know, this tournament, another tournament run, how can you draw on your past experiences over the last two years, um, you know, mindset-wise and what you guys went through when you made it to the final and then even last year when you fell in the, in the opening rounds? We just got to take it one game at a time and stay focused. We got a lot of young guys, and we've been through it all, so we could just help them out and teach them and tell them that, you know, it's just like any other game. Just take it one game at a time and prepare for them. Terry Tui, Digital First Media. Phil, this is your first NCAA tournament since 2016, and, and how excited are you about that? And you know, all you've been through to, to be back in the NCAA tournament. I'm um, glad to be back for sure. Um, uh, last year was hard watching uh, the team um, as we went down in uh, to Buffalo, Wisconsin. So uh, but it's definitely great to be back. Uh, totally different team than last year or the year before that. So just uh, glad to be back with these guys. This is uh, for any, any and all of you guys. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of talk now about the one and done uh, nature of college basketball and your guys who have you know, kind of stuck around and been to the program for a few years now. Uh, what, is, what does that mean to you guys to be part of that, uh, that, that mentality, I guess? And, and what has it uh, been that's, that's kept you at Villanova for uh, these few years? I think it's a family atmosphere that Villanova has, um, has always had some coaches been here. Um, the atmosphere that it creates with the, the teammates, the coaches. We just have great chemistry you know, on and off the court. Um, I think just guys like being in college, guys like working on the game, getting an education for sure. Um, Villanova is a great institution for that. And I mean, I think we're just really, really just glad to be together and working hard together, uh, grinding out in big games together. And we just, everything we do, we do it together. Any other questions for these guys? Jalen, I just want to ask uh, your, yourself in particular, how, how much have you grown uh, since your freshman year when you were you know, uh, kind of a key part of that national championship team to, to now uh, as, as a junior? I, th I think I've grown a lot. I think I've grown as a player, as a leader. Uh, I've matured a lot. Um, it just comes with the experience. Uh, you experience winning a national championship. You experience losing in the first weekend. You see both ends of the spectrum. So um, I think the experience has de definitely helped me mature. And uh, I mean, as a leader, I've seen Josh, I've seen Arch, Daniel, Chris, and Daryl in the past. They've, they've led great teams. So just be able to pick, pick their brains about how to be a leader in this program, um, I've definitely molded to become my own leader. This is for all of you. Mark Herman from Newsday in New York. This is for all of you. How would you describe Coach Wright's style? He's not a screamer. He's, he's, how does he motivate you guys? Uh, he just he stays on us. He wants to be the best player we can be. And if any of us mess up, he's, he's on us for it. He wants us you know, try to be as best as we can be. And 
you know, keep trying to get us better. Phil, how did you keep your spirits up when you faced the Cavs? Coach was always talking to me, uh, text, anything. Um, door practice on the side, uh, just about staying in it, keep talking to these guys, uh, stay locked in. Uh, do whatever you can to get yourself better all the time you're out. Just all the little things he could do possibly to uh, keep my mind in the right spirits and, and help me stay involved with the team as well. Mikel, uh, this site has been getting some recognition throughout the country because there's five players here who could potentially be lottery picks you were one of them. What's that like coming here to Pittsburgh, knowing that there's so many great players here and, and not that many teams really for them? Um, I mean, at this point now, there's there's a lot of – every team is a great team, and they're all going to have really good players. So that's one thing. But, you know, we don't really look at anybody else besides Rafa right now, and that's who we pay attention to. And we got, you know, today to prepare for them, and that's who we're going to get ready for. Uh, speaking of preparing for Radford, I mean, there's the the common knowledge that you know the, the 16 seed has never beaten the one seed. But uh, you know, how do you guys you know just focus on that game? Uh, you know, just uh, try to avoid that uh, becoming that you know first one. I guess. I think for us, nothing changes. No matter if we're an NCAA tournament game, if it's an exhibition game in the beginning of the season, nothing changes for us. Um, I mean, we're gonna play every game like it's our last. Play for a full 40. 40 minutes or even more, however long it takes. I mean, we're, we're, we're just that locked into each other that we want to play hard every possession for each other. And um, no matter who it is, no matter what type of game it is, no matter when it is, I mean, nothing changes for us. Every game we're going to play like it's our last. How do, you, how do you guys handle being one of the favorites for the uh, title, too? I mean, kind of same mentality? Uh, honestly, yeah. It's, it, I know it sounds repetitive, but really nothing changes for us. We really just focus on one game at a time, one day at a time. Uh, we don't look ahead. We just focus on how can we get better that day. Um, and then how are we going to you know, continue to have that mindset to get better and not be satisfied with anything. So uh, that's, that's our mindset. And as leaders, I mean, we have to have that mindset every day we step into practice and obviously every game. Anything else for these guys? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Check one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Check one, two.
All right, we're joined on the dice by Villanova head coach Jay Wright. Once again, I'm sure you're tired of hearing me saying it, but if you could please say your name and affiliation prior to a question that you asked the coach. And again, this can be audio taped, not videotaped. Uh, we'll start today with an opening statement from Coach Wright, and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, happy to be here in Pittsburgh. Um, great town. Got a lot of good Villanova people here. And... Um, very impressed with the Rad Radford team we're playing. Um, great game last night. They got great balance, great depth, and um, just excited to get started. Questions for Coach Wright? Uh, Dane O'Neill with The Athletic. Jay, earlier Dan Hurley was in here asked about the pit job. And you know, you've been in that position where your name is in every rumored circle, but at some point you obviously made a decision that, that you're going to be where you are, at least for now. What goes into that decision making and, and you know, how, how do you deal with being caught up in that maelstrom when it comes? It, it is very um, difficult. I'm, I'm, I'm so far out of it, I didn't, I didn't even know Danny was being uh, mentioned for that one too. But um, when you say it, I, I, I feel for him because you have such uh, deep loyalty to the team you're with at this point, the players you're with. You don't want anything to distract them, and you're talking to them all the time about um, not being distracted, and then you're the one causing the distraction. You know, it's, it's a really difficult um, time for a coach. And again, no, no pity necessary. They, you know, we, we all know how to handle it, but it, it – it bothers you mostly with your team. You know, you can handle everything else, but you just try to do everything you can to keep your focus on your team and keep your team focused on, on what they're doing and not let it be a distraction. Oh, mine's easy. I am. No, mine's easy. I, I just think I have the best job in college basketball. So I, I, always, I always felt that way. And um, so it really was easy for me sometimes sometimes you don't want to just be rude and say right away, no, I don't like that job when it's a, it's a great job, a great school, and you want to be respectful, um, but you know that you're not going to do it. You know, you just don't want to, you don't want to make it, you don't want to make that another story. You try not to address it. You don't want to make you saying no a story. Dan Galston, the Associated Press. Jay, on the same um, level, I mean, it, do you find this a distraction when you have guys like Mike McHale and, and Jalen who are being touted as, as lottery picks and probably aren't going to come back next year, um, you know, trying to keep those outside forces at bay as well? Yes, it, it definitely can be, and it has been sometimes with some of our guys, um, because the closer you get towards the end of the year, if, if they don't have an agent, a lot of those guys are around. Um, you know, if they know the season's going to end quickly, they, they might start thinking that way. It, it, it's a challenge. That is a challenge for those players. We have been so lucky um, with Jalen and uh, Mikhail and just that they're, they're so grounded. They just got such great families around them. They're, they're really intelligent. Um, it just has not been an issue at all with them. Um, as a matter of fact, coming, I passed Mikhail coming out of here and he said that they asked me about the lottery. Like, there's five guys here in the lottery. He goes, I don't even know who they are. I, you know, he's, he doesn't even think about that stuff. It's rare that a guy really thinks that way, but um, he, he really does think that way. And I think it's the beauty of him, and I think it's why he's such a good player. Joe Giuliano, Philadelphia Inquirer. Jay, you have four freshmen who have never had the NCAA experience before. Uh, what are you telling them, and, and uh, how do you keep them from you know, getting a little too wound up as tomorrow night approaches? Yeah. You know, that's kind of new for us, as you know, um, just having four freshmen that you're relying on, you know. I, I kind of sense a little bit, in, even in practice today, Colin Gillespie wasn't his normal self, which is rare. Not Nothing bad, just I just thought a little distracted. I think – you know, I tell the older guys, you know, they're, they're meeting with the media now. I tell the older guys, just keep an eye on them, you know, keep talking to them. Um, but I think 
the only remedy is they got to get in a game. You know, once you get in an NCAA game, you get in there, it is really different than any other experience. Um, we, we could do a whole story on all the differences, but um, you get in there, you feel it, and then I think when you come out of the game and you go back in the second time, you're good. But you got to get in there and feel it. Uh, Omari Sanko for Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. You touched on it a little bit uh, in your opening statement, but uh, just how helpful is it and nice is it to know that uh, you're in the same state and that you're going to have a large portion of your fan base uh, that's able to attend the the, uh, the opening round? Uh, I hope this is a – I mean this as a compliment, but I still feel this is kind of like an old Big East town, and I feel a lot of Big East love when we come here. People say that to us. Um, I know they love the ACC, but they just were in the Big East for a long time. We had, we had some incredible battles in this town against Pitt and um, probably lost almost all of them. I don't think we ever won at Pitt when I was at Villanova. But you just I feel a great connection to the people here, and we have a lot of uh, fans here, a lot of Villanova alums, and, and our people, Philadelphia people come out here to see the Pirates, they come out here to see – Steelers, it's just a good connection in the state of Pennsylvania, so it's, it's a great spot for us. Jay, Kevin Gorman from the Pittsburgh Tribune Review. Um, you've mentioned Pitt is a great ba Pittsburgh is a great basketball town. It is. Just wanted to get your thoughts on what you've seen happen to the University of Pittsburgh's basketball program with Jamie Dixon leaving, Kevin Stallings getting fired after two years. What that reaction is around the, uh, the basketball coaching fraternity and whether you still think that's a pretty desirable job given the, how much things have changed since they left the Big East. There's no doubt everybody in college basketball thinks this is a great job, it's, it, and it is a great um, basketball town. And I think Keith at Duquesne is going to do an amazing job too, by the way. He's a really good coach, and uh, that, that's, that's a good job. Um, I just think it's the simple process of – you know, a coach leaving, a lot of players leaving when he leaves, a new coach coming in, bringing in new players. And it, it takes time. The, the, if you look at programs in college football and basketball, the, the programs that have continuity over a long period of time, and that's what, you know, that's what Ben Hallen and Jamie did here for a long I, – I really think um, – I think, I think that would have eventually happened because this is a good – basketball town and a good program, it would have eventually happened. But for whatever reasons, not, not, none of my business, it, it, there was a change. And it's going to take a little time again. But once you get some continuity here again, it's every, you've, got, you've got everything in place here to have a great program. Terry Tui, Digital First Media. You know, Jay, Phil's going to play his first NCAA tournament game since the national championship game. He's had a rough yeah. couple of years. Yeah. How, how has he grown from that experience? Is, is, how, is he a better person for what he's been through? Yeah, he, he has been through a lot. And uh, I actually think it's been tougher on his parents. You know, he's got, two, he's got great parents who really support him and support us. And, and I, can, I could tell the night he broke his hand, his mom was crushed, and more, like, more for him. Like, now, you know, now this. You know, he can't get through a year. But it does not affect him. He's incredible, man. He's got the best attitude. Um, I, I still think he's not 100% yet, but he's getting closer. He had a great practice today. Um, as a matter of fact, he had our best practice. You know, you know we pick our best practice. He, he was the best player in practice today. Um, he just got, he's so mature. He's been through so much. He's very intelligent. Um, I, I think he's in a great place. I think he's going to have a great tournament. Doug Gillespie with the uh, Pittsburgh Tribune Review. Coach, what, I want to ask about Jalen Brunson um, now being a finalist for the Naismith. Uh, what are some of, the, some of the things he brings to the table? You know, first of all, on the court, but, uh, but also some of the things you, you kind of look to uh, for, an upper, for an upperclassman like that leadership-wise. What, what are some of the things he, he brings? Well, on the court, he's as complete a player as there can be. He's very intelligent, posts up, shoots threes, drives, passes, does everything, uh, defends, rebounds. Um, and and his work ethic is maturity every day. We we joke that he's the most mature person in the program, you know, including all the coaches and me. And he is, and he probably is. He is he is just such a great example to all the young players of um, how to handle your academics, how to handle your taking care of your body, eat properly, rest properly, work out extra. 
He, he had a plan to graduate in three years, and he's, he's doing it. Um, so everything he sets to do, he, he, he works hard to accomplish. It's, it's a great, it's just a great example for all of us, really. And, um, and, he, and he's humble about it. You know, he leads our team in taking charges. Um, I think he's handled all this publicity with Player of the Year extremely well. And um, I, I just, I, I, we just feel really lucky that, that we've had him in our program over these last three years. Hey, Jay, Adam Zagori, how you doing? Hoops is in the house. Hoops is in the <laughs> he house. just made it a grand entrance. I think we've asked you this one and done question about a million different ways, but uh, only two teams that have relied really on one and dones have won the NCAA tournament, Duke in 2015, Kentucky in 2012. Um, why do you think that is, and, and do you think you know teams that are older and more experienced like yours are just better suited maybe to march than those kind of teams? Well, I, th I think the reason that the Dukes and Kentuckys have won it, and I really mean this, um, I don't think anyone understands how difficult it is to coach freshmen in high-level games. Just, I don't care how good they are. I don't care if it's LeBron. You just haven't been expected to have the kind of detail needed to play. And I think John and Coach K do the best job of that, right? So that – that's rare in itself. And then there are only so many of those guys that, that are one and done that are, are capable of winning national championships. You could be one and done and be capable of having a um, potential great pro career, but you might not be good enough at that time to win a national championship. Those guys had some of those guys. Duke might have some of those guys now, and, and Kentucky maybe too. Um, and then the rest of it is when those guys are playing against older, experienced guys, you know, we're playing against a kid, Phillips, who's a senior at Radford. And I'm showing – Omar is a freshman. I'm showing him the attention to detail that Phillips has as a senior that Omar just doesn't have yet. So it's the same way with the one-and-done guys. that They're going against seniors that might not be first-round picks, but they are great college basketball players. And that's why those older teams win. Hey, Jay, Mark Herman from Newsday. Uh, just wanted to follow up on Jalen. Obviously, he's the first guy since Okafor to be player of the year in the Big East and athlete scholar in the Big East. What does that mean to you? And, and does he talk about academics much? He does. I, I'm honestly more proud that we have a the scholar athlete of the year in the Big East, and he's that good of a player. You know, sometimes you, you get the scholar athlete of the year, he's – Great scholar, but he might not be that good of a player. But um, which is cool. I love. The, I would like to have that guy too. I don't think we've had him. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I think that's our first scholar athlete. But I'm I'm way far more proud of that because it's obvious what a great player he is. The fact that he came in and got a three. He's getting his degree in communications in three years, and I know how hard that program is. And I've never met anyone at Villanova that's graduated in three years in any program. I'm sure they've done it, but I just haven't met them. And um, it, it's, it's just so impressive. It's what college athletics is all about. And it doesn't mean everyone should, everyone has to be that. God knows probably none of us are that guy, right? But the fact that there are those guys is really should be celebrated, you know? And it's what I love about him as player of the year, that he is good enough to be player of the year, but he's also a three-year college graduate. And he, and that was his plan. And um, it's, he, he does talk about academics. You know, He does talk about what he's going to do after he finishes playing basketball. And um, he talks about his classes. And, and he is, as I said, he's the most mature guy in our program. He really is. Jay, how are you? Hoops. Uh, <laughs> as, you, as your program's evolved, can you see the expectations – increasing among your fan base and how hard is that to maintain a given level yeah it, yeah I can definitely see it um, I, you know I see when people talk about being out here Thursday and Saturday you know and I and we're talking about hey we we're talking about Thursday we, we got to get we got to get by Thursday so it's it's something that I know is around our players also and I have to we have to talk to them about that you know um, you know, we even talked about the fact some kid could yell at you on campus, hey, um, see, you in, see you in San Antonio. And you say, like, yeah, we'll see you in San Antonio. You put that on Twitter, that's like, hey, someone's guaranteeing. You know, it's 
all of that's going on around them, and it's, it's something we have to be cognizant of, and there's a lot of things that come with those expectations. Then the disappointment comes when you don't make it, too. It could be a miserable offseason, but I would still take that any time over the, uh, the opposite. Any other questions for Coach? Dan Gelson, AP. Jay, what's the, what's the trick to having a powerhouse program like yours and doing it with three- and four-year players that you don't really see in some of these other number one seeds through the years? I mean, how do you find the kind of player who can stay here this long and still be a lottery pick or a first-round draft pick? You know, we don't know. It might be luck because we don't know how long we keep this going, right? But it, there's some luck in there. Um, but we, we, we just – I don't know. You know, I don't know. <laughs> we, I just know what we do is we, we just – we try to find great players, right, that want to be in college so that they really want to be in college. So I want to go there. I want to learn. I want to learn how to be a better student. I want to learn how to be a better man, and I want to learn how to be a better player. And, and I want to be an NBA player. So as I'm learning that, if it takes me two years, I'm happy. If it takes me four, I'm happy. That's just what we try to do. You know, sometimes it works, <laughs> sometimes it doesn't, but it's, it's been pretty good for the last few years here. And we want to try to keep doing that. that. That's what we call our culture. And we're more interested in maintaining our culture than we are getting guys to the NBA or, or winning national championships. It just We just feel like that fits our university, and it will serve every player the best in the end. Jay, regarding uh, Radford, they seem to really – knuckle down on the defensive end and try to control tempo. Uh, what, what are the challenges presented by a team like that? You know what, Joe, they're, you know, I, I watched them a couple years ago, follow my man, Pat Chambers. I watched them go into Penn State and beat them. And di some different players, some of the same, but the teams, the, the concepts. Mike, Mike does a great job with that team in that they have a great understanding of how to win games, not just how to play. Uh, they make great decisions early in the clock, you know, which um, they'll, they'll come at you aggressively. Then they run their offense, and they're not afraid to get late in the clock because they know who to go to. So that actually helps their defense. Then, Because they'll go some long possessions, much like University of Virginia. And then on the defensive end, they're really well schooled. And, you know, you saw last night, they're very good man-to-man -man team. But when they go zone, that's not a team that's just um, – throwing a zone in there. They match up out of that zone extremely well, and they're very good at it. So they have, they have good tempo control offensively, great man-to-man -man principles, great zone principles, and they rebound well out of both of those. That, that's a very good team. I've asked you this 100 times, too. I'm going to ask you again. <laughs> It's just um, nice we see the same old people. We all hang here. You don't have to say the names, but we ask the same questions. It's a good thing. That means we're all in a okay, good spot. Okay. Um, without saying specific names, how many times have you told someone, a prospect, that you thought might have been a one-and-done or you thought might have wanted that to be a one-and-done that Villanova was not the right culture for them? Like more than once or twice? Um, no. no. What normally happens, the ones I, t I will tell certain really good Students, I would say, if your parents can afford it, you should go to the Ivy League. But if they can't, you should go to Villanova. That I'll say. But to, I never tell those guys, you shouldn't come here. I tell them, this is what this is. This is what we do. And you got to want to enjoy being, you got to want to be in college. If you enjoy college, and if you're here two, three years, you're going to be happy. You'll love this place. But if you don't, you probably won't like it. And then they figure that out. They usually tell us no. I like those. I, all those one and done guys that we don't get, I love those guys. I would love them to come to Villanova. I just lay it out for what it is, and they usually decide they don't want to come. They're all good guys, and a lot of them are really good students. All right, thanks, Coach. Thank you, guys.
All right, we're joined on the dice right now by Virginia Tech student athletes Justin Bibbs and the hometown kid Devin Wilson. Once again, uh, when I ask a question, uh, please give your name and your affiliation. Again, these can be auto taped, not videotaped. And once again, all of the press conferences from today and moving forward can be available for download at the NCAA Digital Media Hub at nc2a.com backslash media hub. Questions for the student athletes? Josh Roundtree, 93.7 The Fan. Devin, a, a couple years ago, not that long ago, you were playing for a Whippeal championship a couple blocks away. Now you're playing for a national championship as a senior. you feel like this has kind of come full circle for you? Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, it, it's great to be back home, you know, get to see my family and my friends that kind of get to see me in my last kind of hurrah in this uh, last tournament. So. Uh, just being able to be back home is, is a great feeling, and hopefully we can uh, just keep winning and keep surviving as we go along. Doug Gillespie with the uh, Pittsburgh Tribune Review. Devin, what have like the, the past 72 hours been like for you since, uh, since you found out the team would be playing in Pittsburgh? I mean, how many requests have you gotten? Uh, just what, what, what's, it, what's it been like to kind of go through this whole experience uh, over the past 72 hours? Uh, a lot of requests, a lot of... Uh, asking for tickets, uh, kids coming home just from whether if they have jobs in other states and things like that. So I have a lot of friends still here, and I've got a lot of friends that are coming and a lot of family that still live in Pittsburgh. Uh, but it's, it's been a fun experience, to be honest. It hasn't been uh, heckling or annoying at all. Just, just to see all the love and support I've been getting from family and friends has been awesome. So hopefully uh, we can you know, get a couple of wins in, in this city and be able to, uh, like I said, survive in advance. Mark Berman, the Roanoke Times. Uh, Justin, having uh, been in the NCAA tournament last year, having played in the, against Wisconsin, uh, is the mindset any different this year? Is the confidence level any different this year because of you had that experience last year? And Devin, for, for, for guys like you that, you know, did not get to play in that game last year because you redshirted last year, um, you know, is this, uh, is this going to be more of a, a, a nervous type feeling tomorrow or jitters or excitement? Or how, you know, how is the, the mindset for some of you guys that didn't play in that game last year going to be? Um, I guess you could say uh, I'm more prepared. Um, I have an opportunity to be more of a leader since I've experienced it. Um, I'm ready. I'm excited. Uh, I won't have as much jitters as, as last year, but uh, I think I'll be more prepared. Uh, for me, just I haven't experienced it yet on the court, so the jitters probably isn't going to be something I experience until really you know the game starts. But by then, you kind of. You've been playing basketball for so long that it just becomes a game after a while. But uh, being able to watch it and seeing the uh, the pain in the guys' eyes from last year and being able to lose like that, it's, it's hard to see. So I know that they're going to be ready to go this year. And that's and hopefully the guys that played in it last year are going to be able to you know use that experience and propel the guys who didn't play last year uh, to a good win. Brian Batko from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Uh, Justin, as you know, being next to someone like Devin, for someone who's been here for so long and, and is a fifth-year senior, how much is his experience and just his veteran leadership, you know, kind of helped you guys uh, since you got here. I mean, yeah, you could tell. You could tell just by by the way he talks. Like he knows everything. Uh, he's a great leader on and off the court, and uh, I mean, he's a uh, yeah. Uh, he just finds a way just to you know leave an imprint on just on any part of the game, just in the locker room. You know, something to say, and it just helps a lot. It helps me a lot. It helps the younger guys a lot, and uh, even helps uh, Coach Buzz a lot too. Chris Coleman from TechSideline.com. Um, I guess this question could go for either one of you guys. Uh, as of Sunday when we talked to you, you hadn't seen Alabama too much, but now that you've had a chance to study them, uh, what do you think about your opponents? Uh, they're a very good team. Uh, athletic, fast, they like to get up and down the floor a lot. Uh, they have a couple dynamic scores that can really open up the game. So uh, just, I think we need to be able to uh, guard them as, as a unit, as all five of us, have we, as we have been doing the last uh, couple games that we've been, this new style of defense that we've been trying to play. And uh, I think if we're able to kind of guard everyone and stay as a unit, I think we'll be all right. Yeah, uh, I guess for both you guys, uh, Roman Stubbs, Washington Post, uh, what makes Sexton so good? And, and uh, I guess in studying him and preparing for him, I mean, what kind of challenge is that uh, going to be for you guys offensively? Yeah, every time we touch the ball, he's a threat. Um, He's not taking his foot off the gas pedal. Uh, I mean, if he gets it 94 feet, he's going full speed. 
he's playing for his teammates at times, played for himself at times. He's just a great player. And uh, like he said, we all have to stop him. It can't be one-on-one -on -one defense. It has to be five of us against him, against his team. So, uh, I mean, he's just a great player. Norm Wood from the Daily Press in Newport News, Virginia. I talked with Justin the other day. I asked Devin this. I talked with Justin the other day about the Notre Dame game and, and how the last time we saw you were kind of stumbling in the second half. And, and he said that he spent until Sunday morning looking at the thing, and it, and, it, and it bugged him rightfully so. How long did you kind of pour over that game and sort of suffer over it? And do you feel like there are some things that can be corrected from that game? Or did you just kind of put it in the past? Uh, I was probably a little bit shorter than him just because you know that's one of those games where it, it, it got out of our hands and it, we kind of just let it go and that's something you try not to dwell on especially but uh, then when you look back at it, it happened in Miami as well where we had a second half breakdown that's when it, it kind of worries you a little bit and that's when you kind of get in the film room and you talk to the coaches like hey what's what's kind of happening in the second half where we're dropping off so much whether it's offensively or defensively uh, so like I said you, you look back at both of those games and I think that's where you get uh, better at and that's where you can improve at by seeing what happened in both of those instead of just kind of looking at one where maybe you know shots didn't fall or they you know they rallied a little bit so that's that's kind of how I viewed it. Devin uh, a lot's been made of how the defense has improved since you uh, came into the starting lineup just curious what do you, what do you see as being your your biggest uh, role on, on that end of the floor what are some of the things you try to do to, to help that uh, team defense? Uh, just communication. Uh, I think I, I, I'm loud on the court when we're playing. I think guys uh, trust me that they know I'm going to be in the right spot at all times. And uh, just being able to help the guys out because uh, I try to pride myself on being a good defensive player. And then when the when other guys see that, I think that that kind of thrives them to want to be good defensive players too. But it's been a it's been a whole team buy, and you you see everyone whether. You, they play four, five minutes a game to whether they play 40 minutes a game like Bibbs does. It's, it's a whole team buy-in, and I think that's what has been able for us to propel ourselves forward for, on the defensive end. Justin, does Alabama look like anybody you've seen this year? And how so? <clears throat> Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, a lot like us. Yeah, a lot like us. Offensively like us. Um, a lot of ball screens. Uh, the point guard is a big threat. Um, Numbers-wise, they're like us. Um, a lot of twos. Uh, they hit their threes. Um, transition. They like to get up and down. Yeah, offensively, they're like us. They're like us. <clears throat> With the, uh, what, what did you learn about yourself? Was there a commonality between the Notre Dame game and the Miami game? What, what did you learn about you know, this, the second half struggles that what you want to correct or improve upon there? Uh, I, th I think we relaxed a little bit. Uh, each game we went in with a, with a, you know, a good lead in, the, in, the, in both games. So I think you know, we, we kind of took our foot off the pedal. Uh, not so much as in the Notre Dame game, because the first four minutes of that game, we had a really good run. We had a couple uh, breakout layups. And then in that last 15 minutes is when things kind of started to disintegrate. Uh, but in the Miami game, it was right from the jump. And I think that's where we, we fixed it from the Miami game, you know, coming out strong in the second half. But then we didn't keep it up like we did uh, in the Notre Dame game, where we kind of, like I said, it disintegrated. Uh, so like I said, I think we just need to be able to keep our foot on the pedal and really pride ourselves on why we had that lead in the first half in the first place, which was playing good defense, getting stops, and then doing what we do best, which is getting out in transition and getting easy layups or uh, wide open threes. Uh, Will Stewart, TuxSideline.com. Um, Alabama's a pretty good team defensively. What do you guys see on tape from them, from them defensively? Let me take it. Yeah. Got it. Uh, <laughs> uh, they're long and athletic, which, which really helps any team be a good defensive team. Uh, being able to stop guys and keep guys in front of you is, is a huge factor. Uh, they don't, they're not necessarily small how we play, but they're not uh, really, really big either, kind of like how Duke plays. Um, but like I said, they're really, they're kind of tall across the board, you know, 6'9", 6'8", 6'5", which, which helps rebounding purposes. And they're not getting any offensive rebounds, which helps them defensively as well because they're not giving up second chance shots. So uh, whenever they're able to just play solid and and uh, they also take really good shots offensively too, so that helps their defense. Uh, but other than that, they're just they're a solid defensive team, and that's something you know we're going to have to work on uh, in today and tomorrow just to be able to kind of get the shots that we want and be able to run the floor like we want to. 
the um, uh, what, it's followed by uh, Colin Sexton there, I guess. What, what's the big defensive challenge with him? Is it are you more worried about keeping him on the lane so he so he doesn't get fouled and goes to the free throw line a lot, or is it more of a, him making a lot of threes like he did against against Auburn? And when you mentioned uh, them being a long, you know, athletic team, that's not exactly the, the greatest matchup for you guys, whether it's Louisville or Florida State or Kentucky. So, I mean, how do you kind of uh, beat a long athletic team? Yeah, I think I said it before. Uh, just for him, it's going to be all five of us. It's not just whoever's guarding him at that moment. Um, I mean, he's a great player. Uh, Oh uh, yeah, it's gonna be. Uh, we have to force him to contest in threes, hands in his face at all times. Obviously, we don't want him um, in the paint shooting layups or in drawing fouls. Uh, we're just gonna have to try to contain him and just shoot, you know, just what we call bad shots. Jordan Hutchinson, the Cleveland Times. You know, m most teams say they want to play their best <coughs> basketball in March. Do you guys feel like you you're, you're able to do that now? And if so, why? If not, what do you guys think you need to work on before tomorrow? Uh, I think the last two weeks we haven't played our best basketball, and I think that's kind of that might work into our favor. You know, we we came in seeing what we needed to work on, and now we're able to correct it instead of you know kind of riding that high horse and thinking that everything's okay when maybe they're not. And uh, I think that's a good thing for us. We're able to fix the, the mistakes we had in the Notre Dame game and the Miami game, and uh, if that's able to you know help us. On the defensive end, that's going to be huge for us because our offense is, is what it is. We're, we're a high field goal percentage shooting team. You know, we take good shots. We don't turn the ball over as much as you know we think we should, and things like that. So, uh, being able to kind of, like I said, see those mistakes and being able to correct them, I think is is going to help us in the long run. Uh, to get back to the, in terms of them having size and length. How, how do you guys go about? Beating a team like that because that's that's giving you trouble in the past. That kind of matchup, uh, just rebounding. I think that's that's something that we've always you know harped on is being able to to limit them to one shot. But like I said, I don't I don't think they're they're so much as like Louisville where you know they have seven footers that are just running all over the place and they can run the floor. It's a little it's a little different. They're they're maybe a couple inches shorter. You know, same athleticism, but they're it's just a little bit different. You know, but like I said, that's another challenge that we get to embrace and uh, to try to get over that hump. We haven't been good against really athletic teams, like you said, like Kentucky and, and Louisville, Miami, things like that. But um, that's one more challenge that we get to face, and hopefully we, we face it with, uh, with, some, with something good. Last question for these guys. For either one of you guys, you're, not, you're in a situation that a lot of teams are in. If you've exited early from a conference tournament, you've played twice in two and a half weeks. Which is not, I mean, it's way out of routine for you guys. Is that concerning to, to think about, you know, trying to establish a rhythm and stay in rhythm? Uh, I get, I don't really, I haven't really thought about it like that. That's a, that's a good question. Uh, I don't think anyone in our locker rooms kind of noticed that way because the way we practice is very intense. It's very to the point, and I think uh, you get over that. Oh, we haven't played in a while, or we play in practice, and you know, you kind of see each other, but. That, that's, a, that's a tough situation to kind of be in. You know, you never want to be in that situation, but at the same time, you also don't want to play more games than you have to in, like, in a tournament or something like that. So uh, I think we're in, a, we're in a good spot. We're in a good groove, and guys' bodies are healthy since we, you know, we don't really play a super ton of guys. We don't play 10, 11 guys all the time. It kind of varies from uh, game to game. So being able to keep guys like Bibbs and J-Rob healthy to play those, those crazy amount of minutes, that, that I think uh, is really going to help us out right now. Thank you, gentlemen.
All right, we're joined on the dais today here by Virginia Tech head coach Buzz Williams. We're going to open up to questions right now. Once again, when you ask a question, please give your name and affiliation. Mark Berman, the Roanoke Times. Uh, Buzz, I'm sure you've seen a lot of Colin Sexton tape by, by this point. Uh, what's the biggest defensive uh, headache he poses for you? Is it keeping him out of the lane so he doesn't drive and, and get fouled? Or is it the, th the three-point shots he put up last week against Auburn? Uh, what's, the, what's the concern there for you? I think he's the best guard in the country. Uh, I think the draft in, in June will reflect that. Uh, but I think we would be foolish to think that it's just him. Um, they're ultra talented. And so um, I think there will be more broken plays tomorrow than any team we've played against other than Miami. And I think how we handle broken plays are really, really important. Uh, very effective because of their length and athleticism on the offensive glass. How will we handle that? And then I think because there will be uh, so many broken plays and because of offensive rebounding, uh, how we handled number two on his second touch, I think, is critical. Um, we can't be flat on his second touch. Um, we all have to guard the ball, per se, and be in the gaps on his second touch. I think that's when he's most effective. Yes, he's really good the first time he has the ball in his hands. Yes, he can score right away. Yes, he can shoot a three, a layup, get fouled, would too. But I think it's the second touch where he's elite. And so how we, uh, if you were to break it down in categories, those are the things that we've been trying to prepare for. We don't have a number two on our roster, but that's what we've been trying to prepare for. Uh, Aaron McFarling with the Roanoke Times. Buzz, a 17 mile drive from, from Castle Coliseum to the Deadman Center. You guys are right next to each other here, Radford and Virginia Tech, locker room wise. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Um, just, you know, I know the, some of the guys in there, were, your, your players were saying that you have uh, some of them play pickup games in the summer with mm. those guys. How cool is it just to see the New River Valley represented here the way it's been? Yeah, awesome. Uh, happy for Robert Lindenberg. I've known him since I was a kid. Uh, happy for Coach. Um, yeah, I think that's cool. I, I guess I haven't – I don't mean this at all in the wrong way. I just haven't processed it in that manner. Um, how many teams from the state are in the tournament? Oh, those are the three. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, – I would say that – has that ever happened? Ever? Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't think that's happened. Of course, we haven't been many times. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, you mentioned the, the size and length of, of Alabama. Danny Hurley, who played him this year, was, was talking about that earlier that today right? uh, when I asked about, about Bama. That's not always the greatest matchup for you guys facing a long team. Uh, you know, how do you go about beating a team like that this time? Yeah, I don't know if we can. Uh, we don't have the length or the athleticism. I don't know if we have the length uh, or athleticism at any position. I know you're speaking of their interior players. We don't have it on the perimeter either. Um, yeah, when you when you look at their team uh, and how they've evolved, and I, I watched their game against Rhode Island. I watched a little bit uh, of their non-conference schedule, not a lot. Uh, spent more of it in conference season, but their their teams just continue to morph. Like most teams that are good, they've continued to evolve into something else. But their length and athleticism was the same in December uh, when Rhode Island played them. Uh, that, that'll that cause us problems, just like every team that we've played um, with that sort of length and athleticism. And when they come off the bench, it's it's the exact same. Uh, it's, it's just another guy, maybe with a slightly different skill set, but still has length and athleticism. Hey, Buzz, Adam Zagori. How you Zags, doing? what's up, how baby? You, how you doing, buddy? Um, so we had Coach K and Jay right in here before. They asked a lot of, they were asked a lot of questions about the one and done and how one and done teams do at this time of year. You know, only Duke and Kentucky have won national championships with, you know, relying on one and dones. Wow. Um, Jay said Cal and Coach K were kind of uniquely suited to coaching those teams, and that uh, seniors and upperclassmen tend to do better this time of year and 
only a few freshmen can really kind of carry the load. Hmm. Um, just kind of curious on your thoughts on that and why, you know, there's really only been two one and done teams that have won it. Yeah, um, I would agree with Coach. Um, it would be hard to argue with what uh, has transpired at Kentucky and Duke relative to talent. Um, I think they go about recruiting in a diametrically opposed way than the Hokies. Um, uh, mostly because I'm the coach, to be honest with you. It has uh, nothing to do with Virginia Tech. It's just because of how we go about things. Um, I think uh, it takes a unique gift to coach those guys. And uh, it's, it's a different gift than the gift that Coach Wright has because uh, the consistency of Villanova at the level they've performed at it's not the same manner that Kentucky and Duke have went about those things. It's just as unique of a gift, though, to develop those guys and get as old as you can and stay as old as you can, but those guys continue to improve, and you're staying in national championship contender status. So uh, different ways to skin a cat for sure, but the gift that Jay Wright has – in my opinion, is just as unique uh, as the gift that Coach Cal has. Just as unique, just completely different. And um, I don't think either or is wrong. Um, it's just their approach and how they go about it. Hey, Coach. Oh, is this on? Oh. Um, <laughs> Grace Warrington, WBTM 13 in Birmingham. I heard in your Sunday press conference you mentioned Avery Johnson. I was just wondering – um, how your connection with him started and what your friendship or relationship with him has been like over the years? Yeah, Coach is one of my heroes. Uh, I love Coach. I love his story. I love where he's from. I love his path. Uh, I love his college coach. Uh, I love how he fought and scrapped to get to the league and how hard he fought to stay in the league. Um, I'm from a small town uh, north of Dallas. And so I've always been a Dallas Maverick fan since they started. And so when he played for him, when he coached for him, um, loved him. And uh, upon his arrival into college basketball, for whatever reason, um, I think we've probably privately spoke more than anybody thought. Um, I think that uh, when he got to Alabama, and the, the state of the program and what he's been able to do in his three years. Um, I don't know that you could have done any better. Um, the coaches that he's hired, uh, what he's done at Alabama, not that Coach Saban has done anything but flourish and help that. I just think he's done a fabulous job. He's always been really, really kind to my two boys. Um, and so I just, he's one of my heroes. Buzz, uh, Robinson said something interesting in the uh, locker room. He said, he says, you know, we need to give ourselves more credit than we give ourselves. I know you preach humility, but is there a certain swagger that you need to play with this time of year that you'd like to see out of your players? Uh, I said that to our team uh, 10 or 12 days ago, uh, and I appreciate how Five said it. He probably said it a little more politically correct than I did, but um, – if you really study uh, what's transpired, if you even talk about five, if you study what's transpired since uh, we've been here, I think it's pretty remarkable. Uh, when we were hired, we were 244th in the country. And tomorrow we're the 31st team, seeded team in the tournament. Um, but what I apologize to our team for is that I'm just not really good with you guys. And so I only do what is required so that I don't get in trouble. And I don't think that at all times does that um, give the credit that our kids and our staff are deserving of. I think if you look at any Power 5 team over the last four years, maybe if you studied it over the last 20 years, because I have, upon arrival through year four and watch the trajectory, I think uh, – it's been minor miraculous what's transpired. And so I just apologize to our kids. Um, five's the only all-conference player since we've been here. <laughs> that's, uh, that only adds to the miracle, in my opinion. And that's when I apologize to the team. Because I think maybe if I was a 
more politically correct, a little bit more polished, uh, even with you two guys, it would help. Um, and I think uh, I wanted to apologize to them for the disservice, if that would be what it would deemed be called, um, that I'm not more outspoken about who they are. But I do, uh, I want to be more humble in spirit if there was anything to be known for. I, I would want that. I would want to be known for that more than anything else. Coach uh, Will Stewart with TechSideline.com. Um, you've coached in a lot of NCAA tournament games, and these guys haven't played in a lot. Yeah. Um, for this particular group of guys, do you treat it as business as usual? Do you let them know how big it is? What's the, what's the best way with their psychology to get them to focus and play their best? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, we've went about it a little different this year. Um, if there would be one thing that I would say uh, specific to last year, I don't know that we prepared for the event as much as we should have. I think we prepared for Wisconsin. I think we prepared for the opponent. But I don't know that I did a good job helping prepare them for the event. One of the other things that I would add to the miraculous thing that nobody said, and that's fine, only three guys uh, in our program played last year, and we're back again. I think that says a lot considering the, what's transpired over four years. So we've spent a little bit more time, me specifically, with our kids on preparing them for the event. Um, the timeouts, this, uh, what we're about to do, why we're practicing late, uh, the tip time is not going to be what it says it's going to be on the internet, how the officials work, What's an NCAA tournament share? What does that mean? All of those things, just so that they uh, understand it maybe from an educational standpoint. Um, there were some kids that watched it last year um, that were in our program but didn't play. So I hope that because some of us have had some level of a rep of doing this, we'll be better than we were last year. Maybe not specific to the opponent, but specific to the event. Coach up front here, Colin yes, Sexton's known for, for you know sometimes getting an opponent's head with his uh, competitiveness, the way his, his kind of spirit on the floor. How do you prepare for someone like that? Oh, we've, uh, I, I can't speak to that. Uh, I can speak to his talent, um, but yeah, we've we've played against a bunch of guys that are competitive. Hopefully, we have some guys on our roster that have that same competitiveness. But his talent is semi otherworldly. Alabama and uh, SEC version of, of any ACC team, either offensively or, or defensively? If you, if you study the numbers that matter, Berman, um, and you put Alabama in the ACC, uh, they would be third in the league relative to tempo. They would replace us. We're third. They would replace us. If you were to put them uh, in our league from the numbers that matter defensively, uh, they would be third uh, behind uh, Virginia and Duke. I, I think as good as they are offensively, and uh, two is obviously a, a big key to that. 23 is a big key to that. Uh, I think 25 is really good going downhill. I think zero is an elite level runner jumper. Um, three is a mismatch nightmare uh, because of his, quote, game. I think 30 is probably, just from me watching and never talking to any of them, I think 30 is one of their smarter players other than Coach's son. Um, 12 has great length and size and can do whatever he wants to do with the ball. I think as much as given notoriety that's given to them offensively, I'm not sure that they're not just as good or better defensively if you really pay attention and study the evidence of their numbers and the more I watch tape of them, I think they're, they're very good defensively. Brian Batko from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Uh, Buzz, Devin was telling us how much he's looking forward to his homecoming. Yeah. Uh, in, in terms of just his career with you, I mean, how surprised are you that in this day and age of 800-some transfers in offseason that he stuck around that first year you came in and has obviously stuck around every year since and helped you guys? Yeah, uh, you could write uh, – as big a story as your paper will allow on, on just that. Um, I think he's a throwback. Uh, I've, we take a tour every year uh, in the spring 
Uh, there's 10 people on our staff, and we all get on a plane, and we go see every returning player, and we call it the thank you tour. And so we go see every returning player. Uh, we give them an update on where their child's at academically, where their child's at relative to their degree plan. Uh, each child does a video uh, thank you where we record them and show it to their parents. Uh, we do clips like a scouting report of Devin. Hey, this is where Devin, uh, here's some clips of Devin defensively. Here's some clips of him offensively. Uh, we give them their itinerary for, their, for the summer, what we're going to work on, what their goals are on and off the floor. So uh, we went and saw nine kids last year. Obviously, Devin was one of them. Devin was coming off playing in football. So Devin didn't join us until January the 1st. And um, his parents would probably answer this question better. Um, he's a throwback because of how he's been raised. Um, his parents have never said a word to me other than how you doing. And, and uh, to Devin's credit, all he's ever said is yes, sir. So he finished in last place uh, as a freshman. And our first year there, he finished in last place. And for um, the first time in over a decade, we go to the tournament last year, and he doesn't get to play. And then he's been the catalyst behind our change defensively at, since February. And then for it to be able to be here, I just uh, I agree with what you said. Maybe it's just the way of the world. Uh, my children have a lot of that in them, too. To be able to stick something out, that's rare anymore. And most kids, it's just, uh, I quit and I'm going somewhere else. And that's never been the case in any, in any sense. Um, he, he has had more of an impact on our program and played less than any player I've ever seen in my career as an assistant coach or a head coach. He's so respected amongst his peers, whether he's playing or not. And uh, for this to end on this stage for him and this city, um, it's beyond a lifetime memory, I think, for him. Coach Alyssa Ray, WSLS yeah. 10, to have Chris Clark healthy and back, to have Devin Wilson back in the lineup, um, how beneficial is that to have these extra weapons? I know Nikhil's also a freshman. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, excited for those guys. You know, Chris didn't get to play last year. In essence, Ty replaced him. And you could say that Ty was the reason we went to the NCAA tournament. And then Ty tore his ACL in the summer, and so he's not going to be able to get it. Uh, Dream was a starter last year and then left and came back. Uh, he's black Jesus in our program. He, he, he's resurrected. Uh, and, and now he doesn't get to play. And then I, I think the, you know, Pig's uh, test score was pulled last year. I never said that. And he couldn't play, but he got to watch it, and now he gets to play. And then the three true freshmen, I think they've – most coaches tighten their rotation in February, and I did the exact opposite. And I didn't know that it would be true, uh, but I thought that they could help us. And they've made such a – even though the minutes don't necessarily say it, it's similar to Devin's impact. Those guys have really helped our team over the last ten games. Uh, so I'm excited for all of those kids to have the opportunity to experience this. Last question for Coach. Uh, right here, Buzz over here. Yes, sir. Um, watching from a rival conference to the SEC, what do you think of the league's rise? Do you think they were helped out by the quadrant system this year? And uh, you've obviously watched enough tape of Alabama to see the league as a whole. Just, um, you know, is there some kind of mystery with the SEC that they've been able to get eight teams in this year? Just to see how they do? Yeah, um, I, I don't think it's a mystery. If you, if you look at the league 10 years ago, uh, if you looked at the league five years ago, I've only been a head coach 11 years, so I don't want to speak longer than that. What I would say even now as a huge fan of football, when you think uh, where is the best football in college football, you think of the SEC. And uh, one of my uh, – uh, not spoken reasons for wanting the Virginia Tech job as I knew everybody said it was the worst job in the best league. And so I wanted the critique that most of these guys in here gave me on committing career suicide to take the job. 
but it was the best league in the country basketball wise. So it's SEC football and ACC basketball. And I think what's happened just from an outsider in the SEC basketball is I think the coaching changes over the last five years has been dramatically different. The commitment from those schools specific to those coaches and those programs, I think that's when you've seen the rise relative to that. And I do think uh, because the committee's looking at quadrant one and two maybe different than they ever have in the past, I still think that it's too reliant on RPI, and I don't think RPI is necessarily the right metric, but that's just my opinion. But if you just look at quadrant one, I think that's why there's eight teams from the SEC. So I think they're scheduling different. Thank you, Coach. Yes, sir. Thank you for being nice to me. Nice talk, Thank you.
All right, we're joined on the dais today by uh, Radford student athletes, excuse me, Ed Polite Jr. and Malik Jones. So, um, again, if you have a question for these guys, please give your name and affiliation. And also, this can be audio tape, but not videotaped. So we'll open up the uh, press conference to questions. Uh, I think I messed up the. Sorry. Yes. Polite. Polite. Yeah. Sarah Spencer with a quick that. Just for both of you guys, going up against kind of like a powerhouse in Villanova, what kind of opportunity does it present to you guys as a team? Uh, no, we're going to come out and play each game, no matter who the, what the name says on the jersey, we're going to come out and play our hardest and play to get a win. I just feel like it's a big game. I'm, I'm very excited to be able to play in this game. And like you said, we, no matter what the shirt or jersey says, we're going to come out and give it our all. John Small with Philadelphia Inquirer. Carly, um, you, it's probably been an interesting last couple of weeks for you since you hit that shot. It's been all over TV. It's been, uh, can you, one, explain what that's been like, and two, was playing in the uh, game last night good for you all to get back to the sense of this is about basketball again? Well, the the experience after the shot has been has been crazy. Uh, a lot of people have been you know messaging me, uh, to just basically saying congratulations. My phone's just been nonstop going off. And as far as the the last game. It was, I just think we all just was bought in. Uh, we were determined to get this win, that win. And, I mean, we got the job done. Ed, along the same lines, uh, you know, a lot of times when you go into that playing game, well, a lot of times when teams come from a mid-major, you wonder if sometimes the excitement of going right into the tournament gets to them. but. When you have to play that play and gain, it just seems, does it give you a new focus on basketball? And was maybe playing in a play and game good for you all? Uh, I think it was, it was good for us to give us another game to get our juices flowing again after having a couple of weeks off from a week off and some change off from the uh, playoffs and winning the championship in the Big South. So, but. No matter what game it is, we're gonna go into it with uh, this could be it's a win or go home. So we're gonna give it all. Ryan Fannin with Villanova Radio. Uh, can you just talk about um, Ed? What you see is the biggest strengths of your ball club uh, throughout the year. Your top two or three strengths. Um, that uh, you've seen throughout the year for you guys. And uh, also, uh, if you could talk a little bit what Coach talked about on the air last night about the whole year with you guys pick seventh and how you guys use that as a motivation all year long. Uh, I think our, our biggest keys on this team is our, our bench and just how much juice and energy we bring to each other each and every day, the motivation and all that. So, and I think that went along with our, us being in seventh place and people not believing in us. So, that motivated us through the whole season, coaches uh, making sure we knew that people thought we were seventh place. So, that made us go out and practice and practice even harder than that played into the game. Can you guys talk about? Villanova and what you you know what you see. I know you probably haven't had a lot of time to study them, but what do you see about Villanova and what do you all think that their strengths are and how you all could match up against them? Uh, you know we know their uh, size is probably going to be a difference. So, but we're going to trouble them with with our the other advantages we have as well. So. We just know we got to pressure them, and we know they're going to try to get, the, get into their offense and play iso ball with us because we're smaller. But 
we're going to play a uh, five-man defense, so we all going to be balling in on defense. Nobody's going to play by themselves. I think any of our guards, whoever checks them, is going to, going to give them trouble. Any other questions for these two? Talk a little bit about um, the season as a whole. Uh, so much talk about the win over Liberty, but uh, just as you guys look back at the year, each of you, uh, just talk about maybe a, a non-conference game that you played, maybe that stood out, that was a great experience for you that maybe could lend to uh, this Villanova game in terms of a, a big opponent you might have played in the non-conference slate. And then uh, what did you guys see as the biggest win of the year for you guys outside of, of course, the championship game aside from that in the Big South title game? Um, one of the one of the big wins, I believe, uh, for us out of South of the the non-conference game would be uh, ECU. Uh, we uh, played them on their home floor and uh, was able to get out of there with a a big win. Uh, I, I can't really talk about how like I can't really compare you know Villanova to ECU, but like you said, uh, outside of the conference, I feel like that that was a big win for us. Uh, I agree. I think it was. I think ECU was a big non-conference win, and and uh, James Madison was a big non-conference win as well. But uh, I think uh, a lot of teams we should have beaten, we could have beaten in the non-conference, like uh, a lot of close games. But not. I can't name another one. A lot of teams that are in, in the lower seeds, they talk about Cinderella runs or, you know, miracle wins. Coach Jones went through one with Virginia Commonwealth when they got to the Final Four. Has he talked to you all about how it's not just your dream and that if you do the right things, it can become a reality? Um, yes, all the time. He just talks about um, just just playing hard for one another. Just Just being us. Don't try to you know, be a hero or or try to do things that you haven't done all year. Just, you know, come in as a team, play as a team, fight for one another, and maybe the outcome will be good. Any other questions? Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks. Thank you.
Absolutely. I guess you can look with, yeah, no problem. Thank you. All right, we're joined by Coach Mike Jones of Radford on the dais. Um, once again, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and identify yourself in the outlet you're with. Uh, I haven't said this one in a while. Um, all the press conferences today can be downloaded via the NCAA Digital Media Hub. Go to ncaa.com backslash media hub. Uh, we'll start off with a opening statement from Coach, and then we'll open up to questions. <clears throat> well, uh, thankful to be here. Uh, really a blessing for uh, our team and our program uh, to have this opportunity to play in the NCAA tournament. Um, we are really excited about this opportunity, and uh, we plan to enjoy the, the experience, enjoy the moment, and uh, hopefully be ready to play uh, You know, one of the toughest teams in the country. Hey, Coach, John Small with Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, you know, the playing game is what it is, but when you're a team and you're coming off the excitement of the way you all won the Big South Tournament and there's a celebration, you hadn't been to the tournament in a long time, is the playing game actually for you all kind of helpful because it gets them refocused almost immediately back on basketball and the business at hand? Yeah, good question. The um, You know, the best part about uh, – winning that championship that day is our students were on spring break. Uh, we got to, you know, digest it, but they also got a chance to go home, spend time with their families, enjoy it for a few days. And then when they came back toward the end of the week, we refocused on, you know, ourselves, which is, you know, getting, you know, better with all of our fundamentals and so forth before we even knew who we were going to play. And uh, then once we figured out who we were going to play, then it was like, you know, guys got refocused yet again. So there were several things that really helped our guys stay locked in on the task at hand. And then playing in that game certainly is a chance to get back on the court after a long stretch. It would have been, I think, almost 10 days uh, that we had played a game. So we're a little bit rusty. But, uh, you know, once you got into it, uh, you know, I think that that experience really helped our guys. <clears throat> Coach Eric Johnson, WSLS 10, to your right here. Uh, Coach, we talked to your players last night, and they talked about the fearlessness that they have, uh, even though it's one of the, the top teams in the country that they're going against. Have you seen that uh, come out of them, especially down the stretch uh, part of the season? Uh, yeah, you know, our league is really tough. It's an underrated league. There are a lot of good coaches, players, and, and programs within the league. And so uh, they, I mean, UNC Asheville won the league, and they gave USC all they wanted on their home court last night. And it's, it was kind of that way all year, where we really were tested by the teams in our league. But we also played a tough non-conference schedule. Um, you know, we got beaten ahead by this same Virginia Tech team this year. Um, uh, Ohio State, you know, who at the time I think it was our first or second game of the season. No one thought that they were very good, but you know they have an excellent coach and Chris Holtman, who was in our league by the way at uh, Gardner Webb. Uh, so you know our guys have been through some, you know, been battle tested in some, you know, hostile environments against very good competition, and so I think they're you know they're used to the situation a little bit obviously this is different more at stake you know everybody's playing for a national championship and you know Villanova's going to be hungry to try to you know win another national championship but you know I think our guys are you know used to playing against tough competition and in tough venues and you know I think they'll be ready to play Mike can you tell me a little bit about the origins of the cheese t-shirts that you guys were wearing the other night Cheese is something that's, uh, you know, special to our circle. So uh, it's an acronym. I'm not going to go into what it means. Uh, we'll share it with everybody at this end of the season. Maybe it'll leak out. I don't know. You know how there's lots of leaks going on in the government right now. They already told you the leaks already out. Uh, you won't hear it from me. But uh, we actually, um, like a lot of teams, we use a sports psychologist with our team, uh, to, you know, throughout the season, but in the preseason. And, uh, during uh, some of those sessions early on, we came up with, you know, we wanted a, a motto for our team, for this team, for this year. And uh, it's something that those guys developed. And, you know, we ended up getting 
you know, these little red uh, wristbands that we all have to wear, and you got to know what it means. And um, it's ma basically a commitment to this group, to our circle. Mm. <clears throat> Absolutely not. <laughs> uh, Aaron McFarling with the Roanoke Times. Mike, you mentioned Virginia Tech. I mean, your, your locker room is right next to those guys. Uh, you know, some of your players were saying that they, they, they play pickup games with those guys. They go to the mall with those guys. How, how neat is that, just the way you guys are representing the, the New River Valley, both of you in the tournament at the same time? Man, first of all, uh, the New River Valley, uh, Radford, it's just been so – great to me and my family. Um, it's such a special place. A lot of people don't know about it. And uh, so this gives a chance to kind of, you know, shine a light on uh, such a special region to have two teams uh, from that region here. You know, there'll be a lot of folks that'll come up, um, you know, during this year, there are a lot of people that come to our games that also go to Tech games and vice versa. There are people that work at Radford that live in Blacksburg. There are people that work at Virginia Tech that you know, live in, uh, uh, live in Blacksburg and work in Radford. So uh, the, the communities are interconnected, uh, and it's a basketball, you know, rich place. The Radford Bobcats, the high school, I mean, they, they have great tradition. Blacksburg High School has great tradition. So it's a sports area, and so to have two teams uh, here in this uh, region of the uh, NCAA tournament is very special for our area. I was talking with uh, David, your assistant coach, and uh, – it seems like you got some young assistant coaches who bring a lot of energy to the table. <laughs> What's that do for you as, as a guy who's been sure, around I need it. those guys? Yeah. I need it, man. Uh, I don't do the Red Bull or anything. So uh, when those guys come in there juiced up and practice, man, that gets me charged up. Uh, we have three distinct groups on our coaching staff. There's uh, myself and Coach Gerso. We're the old dudes. Uh, we have the... Uh, 30-somethings and Coach Boyden and Coach Lind, and then we have the 20-somethings. They know absolutely nothing. That's uh, Coach Hartley and uh, and Coach Marino. And so it's funny how we you know, we all uh, kind of stick with our groups and get along really well, but also we get along well as a staff. But uh, those guys bring a whole lot of energy and juice to our to our uh, program, and we're very grateful. Ryan Fannin with Villanova Radio. Coach, if you could just talk a little bit about your style. Let's start on the offense uh, and describe the style of offense you like to play. And then on the other side, uh, talk some defense and a little bit about how much man and zone you've played throughout the year and your style uh, defensively. Well, I, if you look at the, the analytics, uh, we play primarily man-to-man -man, uh, for the most part. Um, we'll press a little bit from time to time, you know, both man and zone. We play a little bit of half court, you know, zone, but you know, we're primarily a man to man team. Um, on the offensive end, nothing really special. Uh, you know, we, we try to emphasize sharing the basketball and, and uh, you know, being patient and making sure we get the shot that we want. Um, but, you know, no secrets. If you could talk about your uh, overall strengths of this team, what would you say are probably the two or three biggest strengths of your ball club and then a couple things when you guys have struggled the most or that's sort of popped up at, at times of areas that uh, you've struggled in throughout the year? You wouldn't possibly be sharing any of this with uh, Jay Never. <laughs> yeah. We have a, a radio guy at Winthrop, and uh, it's, it's like a challenge when he interviews me, and I, I get juiced up because he's trying to get a nugget out of me, and I just refuse. One time I gave him something. One time I gave him something. I was really crushed by that. But um, <clears throat> we um, – you know, I think our strengths have, have been this year uh, defense and rebounding. You know, we, we made a commitment to that in the offseason as a coaching staff. Our guys bought into it, and we explained to them that if we could get just, you know, three possessions better defensively over the course of the year, that we could, you know, potentially compete for a championship. And those guys bought into that. So uh, all year long, that's been a strength of ours. It's really gotten better as the year has gone on, particularly down the stretch. Um, and, uh, you know, giving us a chance to become champions and, and to win a game in a tournament. Um, so we hang our hat on that. But, you know, obviously this is going to be the biggest challenge we've had this year. Uh, a team that scores 87 points is, you know, it's hard to kind of shut shut that team down. They got so many guys that average, you know, double figures, and when you have that many guys, it's hard to figure out who you're going to shut down. So, uh, certainly going to be a challenge for us um, 
Um, weaknesses, I mean, you know, I don't have enough time in the press conference to, to point out all of our weaknesses. We, we got a lot of them. We're not, we're not, we're a flawed team, but, you know, I think our guys believe in each other. Uh, I think uh, the, the circle has begun stronger and stronger as the year has gone on. And when you have that kind of trust and belief in each other, then, you know, anything is possible. Coach John Small with Philadelphia Inquirer. Coach, a lot of t times at this time of year when teams are lower seats, they talk about Cinderella runs and, and uh, you know, doing something <clears throat> special. And so you actually experienced that with VCU and your run to the Final Four. Does that give you a l little more credibility when you tell your kids, look, this can be done if we do the work and the things we need to? I hope so. You know, we certainly shared uh, that story over the seven years, it, it hadn't necessarily worked with the other six teams, but hopefully it'll work with this one. We um, certainly talked about, you know, at VCU, we were a, uh, a CAA team, Colonial Athletic Association team. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, it's been publicized that a lot of people didn't believe that we belonged in the tournament at all. And then to go to, you know, the, the Final Four was uh, certainly an amazing uh, story. But, you know, our guys believed that they could, you know, and, um, you know, that is the point that we've tried to get across to our team is that, you know, anything is possible if you believe your belief is strong enough and if you work hard enough. And obviously some things have to fall your way. But we've certainly shared the story and uh, hope that those guys, you know, uh, have the same level of belief in each other and what we do. Uh, can you talk about the way you've expanded your bench giving you more time. And if there is something that Villanova is weak, it is, it is their depth. And sometimes, they, you know, with injuries and things, they don't have. I mean, can you just talk about how important the bench play will be? And could that be a key against Villanova? Um, you know, at the beginning of the year, in the in the fall, that was the thing that I was most worried about with our team. In, in today's society, uh, there's so many transfers, and uh, when you have 13 guys on scholarship and they're all raring and ready to go, it's kind of hard to manage that. And we certainly had our struggles throughout the year uh, with guys that were not always happy with the amount of minutes, the, the role that they had and things like that. And we, we dealt with it all year long, and there were a lot of, you know, uh, one-on-one -on -one sessions and lunches and trying to get these guys to buy into their roles. And as they became more bought in, we told them that our bench was either going to be a weakness or a strength. And it could be a weakness if everybody's upset about their role. It could be a strength if everybody buys into it and, you know, understands that there'll be, you know, time for everyone to, uh, you know, contribute to us winning a game. And so uh, as the year went on, we really embraced our depth and it's become a strength of ours. Uh, whether or not that has impact uh, against a team like Villanova, it's still going to be very difficult uh, because uh, they play extremely hard. They're extremely disciplined on defense. They don't necessarily foul a whole lot. They, they're physical without fouling. And, uh, you know, so it'll be hard to get to them. But, you know, obviously if we can do that, it is certainly better to play against a guy who averaged three points a game than a guy that averaged 11. <laughs> but, uh, you know, like I said earlier, uh, you know, the guys that come off the bench for Villanova are probably, you know, four stars or five star players. So it's a little different than, a, you know, another team that maybe comes off the bench. <clears throat> Coach, I want to ask you about a couple of your players last night watching that game and uh, what Travis Fields Jr. gave you off the bench. What an incredible spark. Break down his game from last night for us, if you can, and then uh, that dunk that Polite had um, and the athlete that he is, just maybe if you could give us some words or phrases to describe him as, as a power forward, a big man in your program. Travis Fields, um, you know, we recruited him uh, uh, out of high school, but he went to Old Dominion and walked on. Uh, then he uh, decided to come to us and we put him on scholarship so he was eligible to play uh, right away. Um, he has just been, uh, you know, he's a tough-minded dude. He's a winner. You know, he won three uh, straight state championships in high school. Senior year, he hit the game-winning uh, jump shot to win the game for him. So, he's, you know, he's used to the, the pressure. He's used to the moment. He's not afraid of the moment. And uh, in the last four or five games, he's been playing his best basketball of the year. Um, 
Ed Polite, you know, uh, very under recruited in high school. Um, I had a I coached a kid at the University of Georgia named Travis Leslie, and uh, Travis Leslie was you know a freak athlete, uh, like. Uh, <laughs> 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 we got the silly crew. Is that legal? Is this is this legal? Is this legal? Are you allowed to break into a press conference like this? <laughs> That's cheese, Coach, cheese. <laughs> oh, man. Can you hear me? You turn my mic off? Hey, I know you can hear them. <laughs> we can always hear them. We, we, got, a, we got a crew, man. Um, can, can you still hear me? Okay. Um, <laughs> these guys. Um, and that was led by our assistant coach, by the way. <laughs> it wasn't the 17 and 18 year olds. It was the 30 something. Uh, Ed Polite, he, um, he reminded me of Travis Leslie, who was at University of Georgia, freak athlete. He doesn't know how high he can jump. You know, and a lot of times we tease him, you know, about dunking on people and he won't do it. And uh, so it was, it was fun to see it. He gives us so much energy and juice when he, when he takes off like that. The guys get fired up and that gives them a little, little extra uh, pep in their step when they, when they see him do something like that. So we, we'd love for him to do it a lot more. Last question for Coach. This is obviously a pretty loose group that you have here. Uh, you talked about wanting them to enjoy every moment of it at the selection show. Uh, do you feel like they have? Is, is this usual for your team, or is this kind of a, a little bit of an extra thing? Yeah, that's, that's definitely usual uh, for these guys. Um, you know, when we walked out, we had a shoot-around the morning of the championship game against Liberty, and uh, they came out with, you know, a boom box on their shoulder and playing music, says nobody <laughs> wants us to win. I mean, they're, they're a wild crew, man, but uh, they're fun. We got a lot of personalities on the team. But the thing that I like most and the reason why we've had success is that they're all they're great guys. They're really, uh, you know, humble, uh, God fearing guys, uh, guys that love each other. And, you know, as they've gotten closer together, our team has gotten better because, you know, they um, they really love each other, and have great relationships. And so that's what's allowed us, our team to grow as a team. And uh, it's been a it's been a really fun group to, to work with and I'm just so thankful to God that I, I get the chance to lead this group uh, it, it's not about the wins for us it's about me serving these young men and making sure that they um, you know they are prepared for life after they get out of Rafford so uh, they've been they've been a lot of fun and, and made my job a lot easier thank you coach thank you
All right, joined at the podium by Alabama student athletes Colin Sexton, Herbert Jones, Braxton Key. Once again, uh, when you ask a question, please give your name and your affiliation. Um, and also, audio tape only, no video with this press conference. So with that, we'll open up the uh, question to you guys. Sir Braxton, this is Matt Norlander with CBS Sports. What makes the guy to your left, in your opinion, the most dangerous and best point guard in America? Uh, we believe he's the best point. We believe he's the best point guard in America. Um, he's fast, uh, smart with the ball, makes really good decisions, uh, just takes care of the ball, too, and uh, leads the team really well. Uh, you see how aggressive he is each and every night, and he brings it, and that uh, feeds off to the team. So his aggression, his passion, uh, it just helps uh, feed us into just playing hard and aggressive. Mark Berman, the Roanoke Times. Uh, Colin, what was working so well for you and for, for the team last week in the tournament that you kind of want to bottle and, and, and uh, do just as well this week? Uh, I, feel, I feel like we played a whole um, game. We played 40 minutes of uh, basketball. We didn't play as spurts. Um, we gave our all the whole 40 minutes, and um, we just didn't give up. And when we're playing like that, I feel like nobody can beat us. Mark Herman from News there in New York. Colin, you get a lot of attention and people talk about you a lot. How do you deal with all of that? And what are your feelings about going into your first NCAA tournament game this year? Um, honestly, I don't use like what people say to, to distract me. So I just like stay off like all social media. So I'm not on it. So I really don't like see what people say, comment back, good or bad. And then also I feel like uh, going into this tournament, it's just gonna be it's gonna be good for us for the team. I feel like um, under Coach Avery, we haven't went, so this is our first year going. So I feel like it's gonna be a learning experience for all of us and be able to um, be there with the guys and and try to win some games. Jeff Goodman with ESPN. Colin, what's been the most important thing that, that Avery's taught you this year as a point guard? Um, honest, honestly, I feel like he taught me to, to adjust to the other team's scout reports and not come in the game um, thinking, like, this is how I'm going to get off and stuff like that. He told me just to um, let, let the game come to me and also make sure I get my teammates involved into the game as well so that it opened up everything else for me. Colin, um, many players of your generation, just people of your generation, use social media daily, if not hourly, but you don't. What is it about it that you do not like? Uh, I feel like um, if you're doing good, people with you. But then they start. if you start doing bad, people start commenting, say sorry, stuff like that. So I feel like um, just the distraction, it's a lot of distraction, um, good and bad. So if it's good, then sometimes people just like start be like, oh yeah, I'm straight, get a little cocky. But then if it's bad, they try to get down on themselves and then they try to, uh, they get more pressure on themselves and want to do good, so. Uh, Alabama has not been to the NCAAs in, in six years. Uh, how do you guys kind of handle the newness of, of, the, of the situation tomorrow when you're playing in your first NCAA tournament game? Oh, I feel like, I mean, it's still a basketball game. It's not added pressure. We'll come out and play the same we've been playing the past couple of games. I hope to come out victorious. Colin, uh, from Jeff Spiegel, WBMA in Birmingham, uh, the so-called one-and-done guys seem to have, you know, the uh, I guess a reputation, a an image of I just care about basketball. I don't care about school. Talk about how seriously you take your academics. And if, the, uh, if Herbert and Braxton could also talk about that as well, how serious you take your academic life. Um, I feel like it's important, um, very important, because um, if you ain't got the books, then a lot of things won't open up in the future. So I feel like that's the most important thing. And then also my siblings, they got their degrees 
So I want to get mine as well. So that's what just pushes me. And then also me and her, me and her been in the same class, so we battle, we battle it out. We try to see who get better grades and stuff. So um, it's just like a competitive thing. And then, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he take we all coach every pre, uh, praises that we all take grades serious because he's always says uh, the ball is to stop bouncing eventually. So whether you play 20 years in the NBA or don't ever play uh, after college, so. Uh, it's great to see a guy like Colin, a guy like Herb, I and mean, they're really smart guys. Uh, and to see them compete, it makes everyone else want to pick their GPAs up. And as a team, I believe our GPA was a 3.2 this year, so it was very good for us. Yeah, and I feel like with, um, with I mean, bas make it to the NBA is cool, but I mean, if you don't have any knowledge, people can manipulate you when you get to that level. So it'll be, it'll be good to get your education while you can, and it's free, and you get to play basketball, so that's a plus. Herbert and Braxton, uh, I'm sure you hear this all the time, but for those of us that aren't around you all the time, when people think of Alabama sports, they think of football. What, how, do, how much do people embrace basketball now since you've been there? Yeah, the, the culture has changed a lot when we started winning games early and then we went in, like, to a little drop. And you could tell like, some fans started like, pushing away from the, uh, the basketball, but I think it's, it's changing now, now that we made a tournament. I think the coach is changing. Uh, it's been great with football. They've, they've been winning, so the fans are just kind of a little greedy when it comes to winning. So we went on a little losing streak, like Herb said, and they kind of just got on us a little bit. But uh, at the end of the day, they support us, and uh, our coaches trust us and support us. So I, the culture is changing. They're starting to become more, uh, more basketball fans, so that's great. So, Herb, before I ask you your question about your defense, I know you had a 4.0, I think, in high school. Yes, sir. So I, I know your battle there. Who, who's winning that battle academically, and is it close? What do you, will you tell us what you have, GPA? I assume it's good. Oh, yeah, right now, both of us still have a 4.0, so we even. Really? Yeah. You're even? 4.0 apiece? Yeah. All A's? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. It's like double what I got at Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> uh, defensively, like, why? I mean, most guys come into college and they want to score the ball. And you look like that's an afterthought for you. And, and you just want to go hard on the defensive end first, and that's OK with you this year. How did you get that mindset? Oh, well, when I came in, I knew, I knew the recruiting class and the guys that were already I knew what they could do. So I just had to find a way to uh, get playing time, because I knew it would be hard to get playing time as a freshman. And I, I mean, defense. It goes anywhere. You can play defense anywhere. Your shots might not fall, but you can play defense, and that's what, that's what I keyed on. This is for all three. Uh, could you guys talk about what Dante brings to the table and what you're missing when he's not there? Um, he brings a toughness, a huge defensive guy, and he can also do it on the offensive end. I mean, he's just a big piece of our team. And when he's missing, I'm, you can you can tell when he's. I mean, it's a big, a big part of the defense that's gone when he's out. So it's kind of tough with the rim protecting. Even though we still have bigs like Daniel Giddens, uh Galen Smith, and Alex Reese, but Dante, he's a primary offensive and defensive guy. And his uh, his communication is also great on defense, and that's why I think he makes him a great defender. Uh, and he just kind of tells people where to go and where we need to be. And he just leads really well, and like Herb said, offensively he scores really well in the paint. He gets offensive rebounds for us, kicks, kicks out for threes, uh, picks and pops, never complains. He's just a great teammate to have. Yeah, um, honestly, I feel like um, we know what he's going to give us. When game in, game out, he's going to always um, play hard. He's on offense, uh, we give him the ball, he's going to score. On defense, he's going to block shots and run the court. So I feel like we know exactly what we're going to get out of. And when he's not there, it's, it's pretty tough because um, one night he'll give you like, what, 15 rebounds and then give you like 10 blocks. So like, it's tough not knowing um, how to like put somebody else in his shoes, kind of. Uh, for any of you guys, the, uh, you guys have been some really good teams this year, Auburn, Tennessee, Rhode Island, and, and Oklahoma who are here in Pittsburgh. For you guys, when you, when you beat a really good team like that during the course of the year, has there been certain kind of consistent things that have helped you uh, against those really top caliber teams that resulted in wins in all those games? Uh, rebounding, I feel like, uh, personally, I feel like if we, when we rebound, 
get stops and we can run, I feel like no one can stop. No one can mess with us. Really, it's just we're really fast. We get the ball to Kyle or Dazon, just let them push it. We let everyone run their wing, get to the spots we need to, and shoot our shots with confidence. But uh, when it comes to, when we rebound offensively and defensively, I feel like that's the key to uh, get us over the edge. For all three of you guys, um, I think the ESPN power index, whatever they call it, <laughs> gives Virginia Tech a 64.5% chance to advance in this thing. Um, anybody want to comment on that? Is that a big motivator for you guys, being the underdog once again? Um, honestly, we don't even worry about them, those numbers because those numbers don't really mean nothing. Uh, we're just going to go out there and play our game. Any other questions for these guys? Uh, Kyle, I'm sure you, uh, every team goes into their game plan th where their number one goal is to, is to kind of uh, stop you, contain you, limit you. You know, how have you been able to be so effective this year despite getting everyone's uh, defensive attention there? Um, honestly, I just feel like uh, when I'm out there, my teammates, they help me a whole lot. Y'all yeah, don't see it, but like they'll let me know um, what's going on, what do they see, and then also it helps me like judge. So when I come off the screen, they tell, tell me how many people looking at me, stuff like that. So I feel like my teammates are big as well as the coaching staff because um, we do a lot of scouting report and we know what they're going to do pretty much. So before the game, I'm ready for it. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, joined by Alabama head coach Avery Johnson. Uh, before we get started here, again, uh, all of these press conferences that have taken place today can be found at the new digital media hub at ncaa.com backslash media hub. I'm uh, open the floor here to Coach Johnson. You want to give an opening statement, and then we'll let these guys ask you some questions. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, obviously, we're excited to uh, have an opportunity to – uh, play against a terrific team in Virginia Tech. Uh, Coach Buzz Williams has done a phenomenal job with his team. Uh, obviously, they have some experience at participating in this tournament, um, and they have experience that we just don't have. But uh, they're a good-looking team. We've had a chance to break them down over the last several days, and um, they do a great job of spreading the floor, shooting the three, handling the ball, packing in their defense, uh, especially against isolation situations. Uh, so they, they know what they're doing. And obviously, we all take pride in the conferences that we've participated in. We know the SEC has done a great job of putting eight teams in, and their conference had obviously a bunch of teams that made it to the tournament. So uh, I just think you got two really good teams that are going to be playing, um, trying to impress their will on each other. Um, but, you know, we're excited to be here. Uh, we've talked about now that the excitement probably is worn off, worn off of being here. We got on the plane, came in last night. We've practiced a little bit this afternoon. Now let's let's play some ball and, and see if we can give ourselves a chance to um, win this game. Questions for Coach? Jeff Goodman, ESPN. Avery, uh, Dante, his status with the concussion, is he cleared out of – was he in a protocol or anything? Yeah, he was. And right now he's day-to-day. -day. Um, he hasn't been able to do much in practice. Uh, he did a little bit today, but now we have to see how he recovers. So he'll be a game-time decision. Um, I just think right now it's, it's probably 60-40. 
Uh, I'm more concerned about the 40 than I am the 60. And as you can tell in our last game, when you don't have somebody like Dante that's an all-SEC defensive player, then the guy that he's assigned to guard, he'll make seven threes on you. And he'll have 20-plus points instead of his normal five or seven points. Hey, Coach. Jeff Spiegel, WBMA TV in Birmingham. Uh, talk about how special it is to share this moment with your son. Oh, it's special because, you know, I didn't want Avery to transfer to Alabama. And um, I talked to Coach Kennedy at Texas A&M about it. I say keep him. He, he needs to be on his own. But, um, you know, several coaches called that have had an opportunity to coach their kids or maybe I ran into them at an AAU tournament. And they said, man, it's a no-brainer. AJ, you should, you know, allow AJ to transfer. And I thought about it, talked to my wife about it, uh, talked to AJ about it, and uh, he transferred, and it's been great. Um, I don't know if he'll say it's been great because I'm really hard on him. Even sometime when I'm trying to get a message to somebody on their t on the team, I'll use him. But uh, he's been great. He's been um, a great leader, good role model for our players. AJ's been around a lot of basketball, so the bright lights of an NCAA tournament is not going to do anything to him. He's he's seen a lot of basketball, so. I just think it was very gratifying for him for us to make the tournament because had he, had he been on A&M's team, you know, two years ago, they went to the Sweet 16 and a lot of the guys that he played with in high school um, or at A&M. But it's, it's great for our family. I like it better when he makes a three and don't turn the ball over. Uh, Matt Norlander, CBS Sports. Avery, uh, curious about your uh, experience as a player and obviously so many years on the bench. When it comes to Collins' performance, you know, how he played last week obviously gained national headlines. And he's such a fantastic player. But as you get ready to play in this first NCAA tournament game, do you have perhaps, I don't know if concern is the right word, but you don't want to allow your other players to think Collins is just going to save the day here. What is their mindset and what are you trying to Im import to them as much as possible? It's, hey, listen, we can't just rely on Colin to go Superman in the final five minutes and get us to the second round. That's a great question. Um, we're 99 against teams that's in the tournament. And on the left side, when we win, uh, the ball moves, people move. Um, we're very good on both ends of the floor. But on the other side, when we lose, it's basically a one-man wrecking crew because all we do is pass the ball to Colin and expect him to be some superhero. And then he may get his numbers, but Alabama loses. When we're good, we're balanced. We have maybe three, four, sometimes four guys in double figures, and which is Dejon Ingram or Braxton Key, Petty. Um, a lot of guys make plays for us. We have a little bit more of a balance inside-out game. So we're, we're going to try to stay on that left side. And, and we know we're playing against a team that if, if you don't have balance, if you think you can walk in – to this arena tomorrow and beat Virginia Tech with just one player is not happening. So they understand it. Uh, when we went to uh, St. Louis last week for the SEC tournament, it was that's what we were preaching. You know, during our losing streak, it's one guy. You know, he's the only guy having any type of success offensively, and we're standing around watching him. So hopefully, we'll have a little bit more balance because that makes us a better team. Uh, Mark Berman of the Roanoke Times in uh, Virginia. Uh, you mentioned how Virginia Tech lately likes to try to keep teams out of, out of the lane uh, in terms of their defensive approach. Do you feel like that's, that's okay in terms of uh, if they want to have you a bit, try to beat them with threes, that that's in your repertoire there, that you're okay with that uh, approach? I just think we have to be ready to make plays. Whatever those plays are, whether it's a drive, whether it's a pass, catch and shoot three, offensive rebound, whatever it is. Uh, but when I'm watching them on film, you know, both Justins, Robinson, and Bibbs, they do a great job of – you know, playing zone, um, Wilson, you know, they made a change, obviously, in their lineup with Wilson being in now. He's helped them tremendously defensively. And, uh, you know, Buzz does a great job with his defense, man. Does a great job with his defense. Uh, his defense tells a story. I heard he said something about he likes my story, whatever that means. I know it's a lot of mushy stuff coaches say about each other during this time of the year, but his defense tells a story. And our – players better understand their story of how their defense functions and we better understand it quickly because they'll embarrass you defensively if you don't attack in the right way. Hey coach, back here. Grace Remington, WVTM 13 in Birmingham. Um, Buzz was 
talking about you, he had some nice words of respect about, um, I guess, your relationship through the years. Yeah. He was a Mavs fan growing up. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to hear your side of things, just um, how you guys communicate through the years, your professional friendship and such. Yeah, it's good. You know, he, he's a guy um, that I've leaned on for, um, you know, some different types of information, especially when it's specific to college coaching uh, or even hiring coaches. Uh, he's, he's given me some great um, insight on it and advice. Um, so he's, he's, and I'm not gonna let you guys in on everything we talk about, but he's been very helpful. He's a good friend, um, love his family, but fortunately um, we gotta play a game and we, we gotta play our best against a team that we have a lot of respect for. But when you're in, when you come into college for as many years as I spent in the NBA, you don't know everything. I know the ball's still round, you know, the basket's still 10 feet, but there's a lot of intricacies and in, to the craft of coaching in college. And some of it I had to learn and learn the hard way. And here we are in year three of our program of where we wanted to be. And um, guys like Buzz and Coach Kennedy at Texas A&M, Coach Anderson at Arkansas, a lot of the guys, few of the guys that I have great relationships with, they've been very helpful. Uh, ben Jones from the Tuscaloosa News. John Petty was saying in the locker room that he really liked the way the team was able to focus in St. Louis, kind of feeling like its back was up against the wall. Do you feel like in a tournament like this, the team might have kind of a similar feeling with one game elimination? Yeah, as much as we've lost this year, we need to feel that way. Uh, we've already lost enough games. And I just basically told them before we got on the plane to St. Louis, I know they all love the NBA, you know, and I, hey, it's, it's the seven game of a seven game series. All right, you win or go home. And I just told them the, the first two games in, I know you only take it one game at a time, and that's what we say in these press conferences. But um, I just told them if we don't win the first two games, we're out. Okay, and uh, fortunately, Colin shot went in after we had a 10 or 11 point lead and I was starting to feel good about our team. And then we went back to our old self of turning the ball over. But uh, fortunately, that shot went in and we came out and had an outstanding game against, you know, a team that was tied for the best record in our conference and had a dominant performance. And unfortunately, Dante got hurt and we didn't have him for that next game against a team that was clicking at the time. But I think this is a good place for our team because they understand if we don't run hard on the break, if we don't have great spacing, a lot of the things that areas that we've malfunctioned and especially during our losing streak, they understand there's no tomorrow. So I think this is a great place for our team and the timing is good. Mark Herman from Newsday in New York. You alluded to this, but what are some of the biggest differences coaching this level and coaching in the NBA and also just – you you were you were you were a good soldier for uh, during the time of transition for, at the Nets. What, how do you look at that experience you had there? I don't look at that experience at all. <laughs> I don't that experience at all. The first, I was happy when I walked in this press conference. <laughs> that experience, I don't remember. If <laughs> the Mavericks experience was great, no, I'm just joking. Just joking. I'm just joking. Uh, I, I just think more than anything, you got to be patient. You're dealing with young men who are all, by the way, doing extremely well in the classroom. I know we want to win games. I know it's all about the business of basketball. But we have some outstanding young men that are doing extremely well. You know, whether it's Colin or Herb Jones, uh, they're making us proud the way they compete in the classroom and how they represent us in the community. A lot of times bad news travel fast. So a lot of times when they're doing great in the classroom or in the community, you don't hear those things. But I just think in terms of coaching the kids, we wear a lot of different hats. Uh, practices are longer. Uh, they lean on us to be father figures and teachers and mentors. Uh, we're responsible for them 24 hours a day. Um, you know, we get a chance to spend more time with them in practices. Um, fortunately, you know, they're able to come over you know, from time to time per NCA rules to have dinner at my house. And my wife loves cooking for them and he loves her. They love her cooking. Um, so it's just the time and the intimacy that you have with the young men to try to shape their lives. And hopefully whether some have next level talent or 
some are going to be professors um, at, at Alabama or own their own businesses or, you know, hopefully have their own families one day. Hopefully I've modeled, uh, I've been a positive role model to uh, set an example for them, whatever they do in the future of their lives. So I, I like that part of it. All right, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Which is which is harder, college or MBA, and why? I just I don't know if harder is the word. I think that college coaching is different because you're responsible for a longer period of time for your student athletes. Basically, in an NBA situation they come in they practice for two hours and they go home and uh, you know some are married some aren't but really and truly you're not really as concerned because you're waiting to maybe to reconvene with them the next day if you don't have a game but when I wake up in the morning I'm thinking about okay who's in their eight o'clock classes um you know, what are they going to have for breakfast? What are they going to have for lunch? What time is our practice? Practices are mainly three hours during the regular season. And then, okay, study hall. Who's on time for study hall? Um, after study hall, what are they going to have for dinner? Uh, what time is curfew? So, yeah, it's just a lot of time. A lot of my time throughout the day is spent thinking about my players. And um, I think that's the main difference. Well, here's my answer to that, Jeff. My NBA career was about hard work, tenacity, perseverance, uh, fighting adversity, um, failure's not final. So I think that might be relegated to the guy that's drafted in the first round and maybe, you know, he's not a great communicator or he can't communicate how he played the game and teach other players. But my, my whole career was about fighting and working hard. So sleeping two hours a night, that fits me perfectly fine, okay? And trying to solve problems. And fortunately, I had a chance to work, play for, and work with some outstanding people that helped shape and mold me in the craft of coaching. My college coach, Ben Joe, passed away March 10th last year unbelievable man and role model. He allowed me to coach practices in college. Okay, Greg Popovich, uh, the days that we disagreed on strategies, he said, you know what, if you think you know more than the coach, you coach practice. So I coached practices when I played for Pop. When I played for Don Nelson, I had a chance to go behind the scenes and, and spend time with the coaching staff. So I was being groomed for to coach even when I played and I understood the 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 hours and the the hard work that went into it so it was an easy transition for me and then when AJ was a you know a recruitable um, student athlete or prospective student athlete I was on the circuit and going to all of the different universities and in the back of my mind I thought well if I ever became a college coach I like this I don't like that so I think it fits me it fits me fine but I can't say it does for everybody that played in the league. Well, uh, this is obviously the first time Alabama's been in the NCAAs in six years. What is it about this team that they were in, in year three of your, of your reign there that they were able to accomplish this? We've been building in terms of this particular recruiting class. Uh, we thought that, you know, we could have some sort of continuity with Braxton and Dejon and Dante coming back, we were also planning on having Riley Norris, who was going to provide leadership, senior leadership for us, and, and A.J. Jr. coming back. So we thought combining all of those kids with our returning players that this was the year for us to make the tournament and, and see if we can give ourselves a chance to, to advance. And that's what we talked about. We put a lot of pressure on ourselves. We had a heck of a non-conference schedule. And I think that's one of the things that helped us because at the end of the day, you know, going to play at Arizona, some coaches called me crazy going to play at Arizona and playing a lot of the teams that we played. 
um, it helped us. Um, and hopefully, even though we lost, hopefully we, we learned something for this moment in time. Any other questions for Coach? Thank you, Coach. Okay, thanks.